Ros, it's great. General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, Ros Foyer. Um, good to see you again and looking forward to being with you in Glasgow in the next uh, couple of days. I'll be flying up there from Bristol, which is where I grew up. But um, tell us, uh, COP26, big event, landing in Glasgow, thousands of people attending the conference proper and many thousands of activists um, there on the streets and in the meetings, but also coming in virtually from outside of the country. Tell us what the feeling is like and what's the general political context in Scotland that sort of coincides with this uh, big event? Yeah, well, it's been, it's certainly something that's on our radar, Sean. Uh, and just to give people a little bit of context about Glasgow and about Scotland, you know, Scotland's a pretty small nation. We've got about 5 million people in our population. Uh, we have our own parliament here in Scotland, although we are part of the, the wider UK. And Glasgow is very much a working class city with a proud working class and trade union tradition. And we have, you know, about six, nearly 600,000 trade unionists here in Scotland. Um, and people are very aware that the COP is coming. Uh, we have a range of, of issues that, that we are very keen to raise uh, as a movement in the context of the climate crisis. Uh, and we have been really, really keen to make sure that the issue of climate justice and the issues of social justice really go hand in hand. So there's actually been a, a lot of mobilization taking place in and around the city of Glasgow and uh, you know, a lot of awareness about the event, even to the point that, you know, our school kids have been a, an active part of the ongoing Fridays for Future actions that have been taking place uh, and are excited about, you know, Greta Thunberg coming. That's, I didn't realise Greta was coming, but I'm not sure why I find that surprising. That's uh, very interesting. And we can maybe, if there's time, come back to that relationship between the trade unions and, and the climate youth um organizations but very impressive and you know i've been to quite a few cops and um you know they're at usually an annual event it was interrupted because of covid but i don't remember a host trade union body doing as much to connect climate issues with real kind of struggles on the ground in glasgow and uh, we heard just earlier a few hours ago that the rail union RMT has had a big victory. Could you tell us a little bit about that and its relationship to the climate fight that we're all in at the moment? Yeah, so, I mean, over the last few years, we've been really determined to try and, you know, act, think globally, link up globally, but act locally in terms of our, our mobilizations and actions. And, you know, the, the rail unions is a great example. We have four rail unions here in Scotland, eh, as left, the, the TSSA, the RMT and Unite uh, that cover all of the workers in the rail industry and together they have all balloted their members, uh, stood up to take really strong action in the run up to the COP to defend paying conditions. Some of them have been in very long running disputes in, in the lead up to the COP uh, because, you know, their members are essential key workers that have worked throughout the pandemic and weren't getting a decent pay rise. But more that so, you know, I'm pleased to report they were actually in recent weeks very successful, all of them right up to the wire last night and securing a decent pay rise for their members and retaining important terms and conditions for their members. But more than that, they're really on the front foot. So I was at the Parliament with them this morning. Uh, we were launching a, a report, which is the, 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 the union's vision for Scotland's rail services and making the arguments to government that this is not the time uh, which was their agenda to cut our rail services, but this is actually the time to look at making sure that our rail services are invested in, are expanded, uh, and more than that, are democratically controlled and publicly run. Uh, because we've had some severe issues with uh, 
the tendering of rail services to the private sector and a, la a long term lack of investment in our rail. So we've really set out an agenda for the sort of future that our rail services need. And I think it's very important that trade unions have a role to play in setting out the sort of services that our citizens here in Scotland need if we're to have a just transition to net zero and create the sort of sustainable society uh, that we need to see being developed across the world if we're going to tackle the climate crisis. Well, what a what a thrilling victory as we, you know, in the days uh, before this important uh, conference. I mean, it's one of the ironies that the, gov the same governments who shed tears about the climate crisis are the same ones privatizing um, public services like transport and uh, and energy uh, which we can return to later but the um the tell us about what the stuc and the affiliates of the of the stuc want to get out of the cop in terms of your top line messages because transport is part of that isn't it Absolutely. So the transport is one of the key uh, areas that, that we've been campaigning on in the months running up to the COP. And as well as uh, looking at our, our rail transport, we've also launched a campaign uh, that, that's, that's been run at a very local level with local government organisations across the cities across Scotland to bring our, our buses back under municipal control and to, to make sure that we have sustainable bus services. And we've really tried to tap into, you know, if we want to bring people with us on this transition and on this climate journey, then we need to make sure that we're addressing the issues that matter to working class people and meet their needs. So, you know, as well as making sure that, that we have publicly controlled transport services, that's about having affordable transport services and inclusive transport services that are actually meeting the needs of, of you know, getting people included and, and accessible to their cities. Um, it's also uh, an area we've been looking at is around the green retrofitting of our housing. Now, Scotland uh, has some of the highest levels of fuel poverty in some of our cities right across the whole of Europe. And we also have some of the highest levels of substandard housing uh, because although we're actually quite a rich society overall, we're actually a very unequal society. So again, uh, you know, that green retrofitting agenda is about creating good jobs, union jobs uh, that will deliver the green retrofitting, but it's also about making sure that we tackle fuel poverty. And right now, our whole energy system is in real crisis. Many people have gas fueled uh, heating systems in Scotland and the gas prices here have rocketed. We're, we're, we're seeing complete market failure actually uh, in, in those heating systems and, and you know, a real cost of living crisis and the sort of fuel bills that people might be looking at in the period ahead. So a lot of things are coming to a head that really matter to people that, that relate directly into the COP. Yeah, it feels like a perfect storm. I don't want to make an extreme weather event reference here, given the subject of, uh, you know, the discussion around, uh, around, around climate change. That, you know, on a more sobering note, I mean, when I was in Glasgow two years ago, just before, you know, COVID, it was actually the last last uh, country I, I was working in before the pandemic um, hit. There was, you know, a fair amount of, you know, cynicism about the the renewable sector in particular, the, the, the broken promises of the Scottish government and for that matter, the British government about delivering tens of thousands of jobs in, say, for example, the offshore wind sector. I asked the question because we've in trade unions for energy democracy try to draw attention to the problems of the sort of subsidies for everyone regime where massive amounts of public money gets transferred into private hands and private investors, all in the name of transitioning to a low carbon economy. And here we saw in Scotland, you know, a, a really disaster on the, on the jobs front. And I asked the question also, because in the US where we're um, headquartered at the School of Labor and Urban Studies, offshore wind is going to be the next big job creator, according to um, many of its advocates. So any, um, any thoughts on the, the, you know, the struggles there? Uh, because we've yeah. been following it very closely, but for our listeners and viewers, I think it would be really interesting. Yeah, no, absolutely, Sean. There's a real story to tell there. Um, I mean, Scotland actually is, you know, one of the the, the world leading uh, 
countries in terms of renewable energy. And as you'll know, Scotland is a, has a has a background in producing oil as well, you know, in terms of the North Sea oil uh, reserves that we have. So we have a big workforce who are in, you know, offshore oil and gas and who are up for a just transition, but have high levels of scepticism because we were promised for the last 20 years that we would become the Saudi Arabia of renewables. And what has happened is that we have indeed uh, seen the development of, you know, mass offshore wind farms. Uh, but the problem is that five billion pounds worth of contracts have been given out to the other side of the world to produce and manufacture uh, those offshore wind farms when, you know, a, a proper long term plan of investment should have gone into companies, indigenous companies here in Scotland that needed that transition from producing oil platforms to producing offshore wind platforms and and that was sadly failing so you know we've got workers who are actually looking out their windows at a uh, you know who used to have jobs in manufacturing uh, for the offshore sector who are looking out at the sea and seeing windmills and wind turbines that were produced at the other side of the world and i think it's been a real failure uh, in, in, you know, real proper industrial planning and having a proper industrial strategy to make sure that we're creating, you know, local supply chains uh, to, to power this new industry. Um, and we've, we've seen, you know, asset strippers take apart the one and only uh, wind turbine producer in the UK at Campbelltown as well. So we've lost some of the key areas that could have contributed to that industry. And we're very keen to make sure that that doesn't happen as we look at areas like hydrogen. Um, but yet again, we've had another blow on the, and you know, whatever you think of carbon capture and storage as an option, uh, there, you, you can't really fail to see that with the amount of offshore oil and gas that's that's been brought out of the North Sea, that there is pipelines, there is an infrastructure there, there's a skilled workforce there. So if ever you were going to try and develop that sort of industry, the North Sea would be the place to do it and Scotland would be the place to do it. And we've just missed out on another massive in potential investment from the UK government on that front. So you're absolutely right to say that our workers and our energy industry have yet to be convinced uh, that there is an alternative. They told us there'd be 20,000 jobs and we can't find more than about 2,000 jobs at the moment uh, in that renewables industry. So much work to be done there uh, to show our workforce that there's a just transition waiting for their skills. Yeah, and for our listeners and viewers, I mean, there's on the STUC's website, there's a report, I think came out three years ago or two years ago, Broken Promises about, and I think it's a lesson for the international trade union movement and for the climate movement, that unless we build jobs and supply chains locally, the whole project of decarbonization is in danger. And one of the things we've been doing with um, Trade Unions for Energy Democracy is also looking at the solar sector and both wind and solar very, only a few companies globally dominate the markets. And it's just impossible to reach the capacity needed to reach climate targets. So. Surely we're looking, we need to look at a pro-public pathway here and get back to the basics. Most, most energy was developed through public ownership over, over the last generations or so. So, I mean, I know this is something STUC is taking into the COP, the, the calls for public ownership of renewables and energy more generally. Can you say a bit more? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. We do not think that the market is going to provide the, the answers we need uh, to really tackle uh, the transition that we need in our energy sector. Um, and, you know, I, I just think the private sector has shown itself woefully inadequate to meet the needs uh, of actually doing the, the transition of our whole economy properly. You know, we're actually not bad when it comes to, and as I said, you know, we, we are world leading. Most of Scotland's energy now is, is renewable energy, uh, you know, from offshore wind and onshore wind. Um, and, you know, there are lots of uh, research and development going into things like hydrogen power, going into things like wave power uh, as well, which is something that in terms of our natural resources, we have a, a plenty. Um, but these 
things are not translating into jobs and that's where you know you really need a government to take a much more hands-on approach and prepare to be prepared to put down long-term investment similarly you know our actual domestic uh, and, and commercial energy markets uh, in terms of users at the, at the retail end uh, really need to be looked at because they are failing at the moment. Uh, we have an absolute crisis taking place right across our energy sector. And at the moment, it seems like the only answer is that the government's going to remove the caps on, on energy bills just at a time when ordinary working people are really, really facing you know, real economic hardship as a result of the pandemic. So something's got to give here. Uh, if we're talking about sustainability, we need a planet that, that can sustain people uh, and allow them to you know, have decent lives with decent pensions, et cetera. So you know, all of these things are linked. Well, it's funny because I think three or four years ago, I spoke at a trade union conference in Brussels around the European Parliament about the need for um, public ownership of energy and the failures of the sort of the neoliberal pro-market model. And I, they said, well, it, it would have, it's a fine idea, but it's mission impossible. But I get a feeling it may not be mission impossible now. I mean, even the mainstream are acknowledging that it's either we reach the climate target or we persist with the, the illusion of competitive energy markets. And, Energy is so crucial to the climate fight because if we can't control energy, how do we control uh, the climate? Because nearly all the emissions are energy related in one form or another. Do you think there is it? You know, there's something's going to give soon and, and Glasgow could be a moment to sort of catalyze that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the the analogy you used earlier is not um, a, is not a bad one. That idea of the perfect storm, and I do think that you know you taking the the coronavirus pandemic into account. I, I think working people have learned some key lessons over this period. They've learned that. You know, it's not the billionaires uh, and the big corporate companies that have kept society going. It's actually our nurses, our teachers, our, our energy workers, our delivery drivers, our supermarket workers that have kept this country going. You know, it's, it's low paid, essential key workers. Uh, and I think that there, there is a thirst for change. I think workers are beginning to think enough is enough and people are getting angry. Uh, and, and beginning to see that, you know, it took big government intervention to fight that crisis. And I think it's going to take big government intervention to successfully transition our economies and navigate our way through this climate crisis. And I think more and more, uh, you know, leading economies are beginning to realise that that is, has got to be part of the answer. So I think this is a really key time for trade unions to have a strong voice and to start to really, really, you know, raise some of the issues that matter to working people. What we can't have is a transition where it's low paid workers and poorer communities that are left on the scrap heap again. And I, I suppose, you know, I'm talking from a Scottish context, but I'm also crucially aware that, you know, we're a country in the global north. I'd really, you know, I'd like us to also explore how we can support our brothers and sisters in the global south eh, who are ordinary working people but who are really paying the price for the for the the economic decisions in the global north and and you know i think there's a real opportunity now with the use of technology you know i'm sitting here talking to you eh, that facilitated by a, a university in new york eh, that will go out to a global audience there's a real opportunity for us now to as working people to join up the dots and start to really give each other real solidarity and get organized. So I'd be really keen to hear your thoughts on that actually, Sean, about you know, what trade union centers like ours can do to support other trade union centers and join those dots up. Well, it's, um, it's, it's been a very interesting last few years because the uh, unions in the global south, of course, are, as you say, Roz, facing, they're on the receiving end of, of climate instability, and not just the climate, but the effects it has on agriculture and, and uh, urban living, workers in, workers in factories that have no air conditioning, two or three degrees increase is, is really sometimes the difference between you know, life or, or a life-threatening situation. So very much on the receiving end of it. But 
I think the climate crisis and the general crisis of the um, political economy right now, it raises questions about trade union internationalism because many for many years it was either we supported a strike or a specific struggle here and there, or we were against the repression or harassment of trade unionists. But now we need a more ongoing platform of solidarity that's based on, I think, more programmatic commitments to get this vision we have that we're beginning to develop about public ownership, ownership and, a, and a pro public transition into into the mix and, and because that's as internationalist as anything else in my view and Scotland I think as a as the host federation um, confederation uh, I think the STUC is is already set set the tone for what needs to be done in the coming years. Well, that's, I mean, I think it's, it, it, it is a country where there are opportunities to take forward some of these issues. I mean, we do have a government that has, has uh, certainly talked the talk on issues like the well-being economy and community wealth building. And, you know, really, uh, there is a debate taking place in Scotland about, you know, about economic growth and uh, the, the, what use that is put to uh, and, you know, I think uh, there is an exciting time. Uh, there's a lot of work for us to do, though, to continue to, you know, educate uh, working people and really, really knuckle down on how does that affect workers in their communities, in their workplaces. You know, everything we do uh, needs to start at that community level and that workplace level. So part of what we're really trying to do, you know, using some of the issues and the debates that are taking place around the COP is really look at how we can do that movement building because we don't think we can rely on the politicians to change things. It is going to take people power and we're going to have to get angry and, you know, make demands and, and, and really start to push the politicians out of their comfort zone if we're going to get the progress we need uh, on the whole climate agenda and on the social justice agenda uh, that we really want to see out of this. If we turn though to our attention to the inside of the COP, what I think is interesting is that even though there was a lot of pressure on the outside in the past, I mean, I'm going back to Copenhagen for COP15, um, which was supposed to be uh, the, the COP that was gonna decide on what the next global climate agreement was when the Kyoto Treaty expired. And, you know, the Kyoto, what was called the legally binding agreement, the Kyoto model was torn up for a voluntary agreement where governments submitted pledges, which are called nat nationally determined contributions. And yes, they got more countries to submit pledges, but the recent reports that have been coming out, the United Nations Environment Program just this week said none of the countries are reaching their targets that were made in Paris. And these targets are from a scientific and climate perspective, inadequate. But what I, I think is happening is you're seeing it even inside, like the, uh, the United Nations uh, Secretary General has just produced a report calling on climate protection to be a global public good. Very little emphasis on markets and investors, much more emphasis on government interventions. So maybe the pressure from outside is playing out on the inside. What do you think, I mean, uh, the brothers and sisters from from the UK are going to be on the inside of the of the talks. What and I think you're a delegate actually yourself, are you not? Um, what yeah. what's the sort of agenda on the inside for unions? Well, I think it is going to be very much about pushing the need for governments to be far more interventionist and to start to really look at instead of you know just encouragement and light touch, uh, start to look at increasing regulation start to look at actually the state having a stake in key uh, transition and industries like the energy sector. Um, and, you know, that's very much going to be the push that's that's coming from uh, our part of the, the delegations that are in there. Um, clearly different uh, trade union organisations have different approaches, but I do think that there, there is a growing recognition uh, that you know, these things just can't be left to the, the corporate world to determine how they're going to do it. And it's not even something that governments can just throw money at. It has to be more directive than that. And really, you know, what we'll be doing a lot of as well is 
trying to move away from that idea that it's all about, you know, getting individuals to do things. Yes, individuals doing things, you know, is important. It's an important piece of the picture, but uh, this can't be left to that level. You know, I think governments really have to take responsibility and, and start to really think about how they can shift uh, the picture. And, you know, that does come down to how we how we use our energy. Exactly. I thought, actually, I'm just going to pause for a moment because uh, Nicola Larkin has put a question in the chat to you, Roz, and I'm going to read it out if that's okay. It says, Roz, you mentioned that the contracts for manufacturing have been given to the other side of the world instead of keeping this in Scotland. Who is responsible for this, the Scottish government or Westminster? Well, at, at the time uh, most of this was done, this is about European Union rules, uh, but, and you might think, some of you all know that uh, the UK took the decision to leave the European Union. Um, there was a referendum recently um, and uh, the people voted to leave the EU. However, uh, it's a bit like jumping out of the frying pan and into the fire uh, from, from Scotland's viewpoint because um, that that decision has not allowed us to, uh, you know, look at how we do it. We're still bound up with lots of rules about making sure that our contracting is offered out, you know, globally. Um, there, there are a lot of rules that prevent governments from, at the moment, uh, contracting more locally. Uh, we believe there are ways around that. We believe that other European countries actually uh, find ways around that and that it's more a matter of political will. But the UK government, through its internal market spell, I'm getting a bit technical now, um, really have tried to place those same very much, very neoliberal competitive competition laws uh, you know, on all public sector contracting. And these are some of the things we have to look at because... You know, that just comes down to the lowest common denominator. So, you know, of course, contracts will go somewhere like, for example, Indonesia, which is one of the countries that, that picked up some of that work um, because labour rates are lower there. Um, but, you know, I think countries should have a right to, to look at when they're developing industries and putting money into industries and research development. How do they build up that expertise and make the production happen in their own country? Uh, that shouldn't be illegal. Um, and, you know, we shouldn't be racing to the lowest common denominator in terms of pay and conditions. We should be trying to lift people up the way. Actually, that's a very, um, very hot topic in the international trade union community because there's been restrictions through the WTO and the Energy Charter Treaty and many multilateral treaties that talk about the um, the the how local content requirements, in other words, creating jobs and supply chains locally, runs counter to the sort of the trade liberalization agenda. The same liberalization agenda that's promoted international trade, which has led to the climate crisis in the first place. So they cause the problem when we're not even allowed to develop local solutions, but. I know just uh, you probably know this, but, you know, we've been working a little bit with the unions in Mexico where the government there is, has basically announced it's going to take back its power grids to public ownership, stop the privileges to the independent power producers, stop U.S. and other multinationals doing offshore oil and gas drilling. And so I think that the tide is beginning to turn back towards that pro-public direction. So maybe some of the these rules at the level of the international treaties, which I know unions and organizations like Public Services International, the Public Sector Unions, International Transport Workers Federation, all of these are, are really on board, on board with that. Um, we have a couple more questions. Or I see a few more here. This is a tough one. What is the STUC position on at COP26 on nuclear energy as a source of emissions-free electricity? That's Bob Walker from CNWC. I'm not sure what CNWC is, but um, um, I'd be curious to know how that debate's playing out in Scotland, where you do have nuclear power facilities as well as uh, you know large large volumes of renewable power. Yep, we do, and um, I think our, our position is that you know there's we're we're opposed to a uh, nuclear. Uh, been removed from that energy basket at this stage as a an option. Uh, we have members who who work in the, in some of those areas of the energy industry. 
Um, however, uh, we think that as long as the, it's providing jobs, uh, there are other areas that could be looked at for the future. So we're certainly opposed to a, you know, a good working a nuclear power plant being shut down uh, early or decommissioned early. Uh, it's something that we'd like, it's an area we'd like to see retained. However, we want to see uh, jobs being created from our renewable energy systems uh, rather than sent elsewhere. That's, that's um, that, this is one of the issues that's come up in with our work with the French unions recently, the FNME, the French Energy and Mining Federation of CGT, the main national confederation of France, has basically uh, fought off an effort by the Macron government complying with Brussels to, uh, to basically cordon off the nuclear sector, liberalize the whole uh, system. And now the FNME are taking that campaign for a public energy future to the international level. And of course, Scottish TUC has been part of this task force where we convene with Public Services International uh, in order to not just say we're against privatization, but actually show how public energy future offers the best possible approach to decarbonization, not just of the power sector, but economy wide. And, and um, we're looking forward to uh, being in the room with you on November 4th uh, to discuss the launch of that, um, that, public, uh, that program for a public energy future. And, um, but it, the nuclear question, of course, is, is a big one because we see in the US that one the market is, is with cheap gas is forcing the premature closure of I think 21 nuclear reactors that could that if they are closed will basically send power sector emissions higher in the US which is the last thing we need right now so uh, yeah. the point is well taken um, I see there's a uh, John Cartwright I think it's the same John Cartwright out in the out in the northwest of this part of the world um, if you win mass retrofit of housing how can you ensure those jobs will be union jobs, given how the level of unionization is in construction uh, right now. So yeah, that's a really, that's a good question. And um, what we are proposing is that that mass retrofit of housing is led through our local authorities. Uh, a number of our local authorities have direct labor organizations, we would like to see that model extended across Scotland. Uh, we believe that if it's public sector led uh, retrofit, and we're also advocating the, the development of a national construction uh, organization that would help facilitate that, um, and, and, and a, a national energy organization at a Scottish level. So, you know, we are very clear that the best way to guarantee job quality and ensure that these are unionized jobs is to approach it as that sort of model, not to be uh, doing what's happened uh, with the UK government where you're offering grants to rich people uh, to hire cowboys on poor wages to, to fit, you know, new boilers and things like that. That is not uh, the model that we would prefer to see adopted. We want all of our citizens to have decent, uh, highly fuel efficient housing and we want that to create good jobs uh, for people in the communities that most need them. So I think that whole point, you know, that when we talk about energy, energy is an essential public service. The energy question is the key question to how we transition uh, to a net zero economy. So if ever there was an argument for, you know, taking public control of a, a key service uh, at a key time, then that time is now. The time is now indeed. And, but on the energy, energy conservation and efficiency front, which of course is a big part of the whole decarbonization agenda, uh, the International Energy Agency convened an urgent commission on the failure of markets to drive energy efficiency. So is it, again, there's a possible connection with the where some voices in the mainstream are normally quite conservative with a small c at least, are reaching similar conclusions. And does it not, what you suggest evokes this vision of a kind of the New Deal approach? We we're talking about a Green New Deal, but the New Deal of the 1930s that started in the US electrified uh, rural America within 20 years and, and obviously raised the standards of living of um, rural dwellers across the United States. And that model was replicated all over the world. It seems like 
this is the time for bold public works programs, is it not? Yes, absolutely. And I suppose our parallel to that, Sean, is, you know, in, in Britain post Second World War, when we were, you know, absolutely skint as a country, uh, deeply uh, demoralised. It was at that point that workers stood up and voted in a Labour government post the war uh, and, and, and voted in a Labour government that delivered an NHS, that delivered healthcare free at the point of need, free education and university education a massive house building programme for people uh, and a whole range of other really, really uh, key social developments that took place at that time. There were a lot of nationalisations took place at that time to sort of rebuild the country. And, you know, we, we had decades where people could rightly expect that their kids would have a better quality of living than them, that they would have decent pensions, et cetera, et cetera. The problem we've reached is ever since sort of post-1979 and in Britain when the neoliberals and the Thatcher government took over, we have been going backwards in terms of the gap between the rich and the poor reopening and in terms of people's standard of living. Um, so now we have you know, a situation in Scotland where the two richest families have the same wealth as the poorest 20% of our whole population. Um, and this can't go on. And I actually think that people are angry now and, and ready to start to really demand different approaches uh, to how society is working. Well, I always thought politically Scotland led the way in terms of, um, you know, the, certainly the UK left because growing up in England, the English politics has always lagged behind in terms of imagination and courage. I'm always very inspired when I was a kid by the Upper Clyde shipbuilders struggle and the occupation of, of, the, of, the, of the shipyards there. Uh, you got a question here though, which actually alludes, makes a connection to that point because public ownership is absolutely essential. I think there's a growing consensus on that, but how will those public authorities be governed? And it raises questions about the role of workers control and uh, also users being involved and how we can have the kind of public services that are transparent and flexible, but can do the job at the technical level. And I'm surely that's part of the discussions there in Scotland as well around, around the, the new public services that could, could unfold. Yeah, absolutely. I think there is a huge debate to be had around making sure that we uh, take a, a, a fresh approach to public control and public ownership um, and you know some referring back again some of those models within community wealth building uh, you know it, it doesn't need to be one mass uh, nationalized one size fits all uh, you could have a lot of really good uh, community based and community owned projects you can you can have a real mixture in terms of you know what's going to work for people but I think the key uh, to all this is, you know, making sure that people have a say in the services that they get. Ordinary people that are using those services have a say in them and that those services are run on a not-for-profit basis where shareholders uh, or big multinationals that are not based uh, in that community are not sucking out the wealth uh, from the system, uh, which happens far too often uh, when we're talking about uh, how we do uh, that whole free market approach. I mean, let's face it, uh, the free market approach has overtaken almost every part of our society, every local authority, every health board, you know, uh, all of our financial systems are, are governed by rules that say that things have to, you know, go to the lowest bidder, uh, that things have to be competitive. Um, why? Why is that the case? Can't things be for the public good? Can't we make sure that we reinvest in our communities, the profits? Uh, why have people become so wedded to the idea that the market is this force for good? The way I see it, the only people it does good for are the rich, the wealthy and those in power. I think so, so many people, so many working class people have seen through that. But where's the political vehicle to give, it, give that opposition expression? I think this has always been um, a bit of a problem in recent years that we've got a, a certain fatalism in the in the trade union movement that we can't change what has happened, you know, 30 years ago around the privatization push that became a global push. But I'm, I'm sensing in the international work we're doing that 
we are beginning to see struggles for uh, to reclaim public services and energy being a crucial one in terms of climate back into public ownership and reorganizing them around a new pro-public mandate. It seems much more likely now, given the pandemic and the economic crisis and the jobs crisis, um, to imagine that as being um, as being you know highly plausible, if not likely, if we if we do our work right as a movement. Which brings me to a question to you, Ros. I mean, the climate movement. You know, we saw Greta talking about blah 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 and the cops, and it made a lot of headlines. But is there um, is it more that you know, is it more than just about ambition and political will? Isn't it about economic restructuring and a new a new type of political economy? And how do we advance that in the trade union movement? And can we help the climate movement come to um, you know similar conclusions and and join with us side by side, shoulder to shoulder, in that bigger struggle, perhaps to change the way the economy works? Yeah, I mean, I've been. We've made a conscious effort to work uh, alongside uh, climate activists here in Scotland as a trade union movement. We might not agree on absolutely everything uh, in terms of how we get from point A to point B, but we have robust discussions and we support each other where we can. And actually, recently, uh, Greta Thunberg sent out a tweet inviting all the striking workers in Scotland to come and join her at the, the Fridays for Future demo on the uh, the, the 5th of November, uh, and we sent back an invitation to her to come to the trade union block on the 6th, uh, you know, at the, at the COP demonstration. So, you know, I think that shows that there is positive dialogue when you've got Greta saying that, you know, uh, social justice and climate justice must happen together and, and you know, inviting striking trade unionists uh, to have a platform. Um, I think that we... We have often said the message to our, our comrades here uh, in the climate justice movement that, you know, if they want us to be more green, we need them to be more red. And I think that's the, you know, the, the message that I would uh, repeat. I think we, you know, if we're talking about sustainability, then a sustainable planet has to be based on social justice and equality and you know, I don't know another movement that's uh, more equal to the task than the trade union movement for being a force for redistributing wealth within our society. We might do it in quite a combative and messy way at times, but you show me another force that's actually going to push governments uh, to give workers what they deserve. Um, and, you know, I've, I've noticed a lot of people from, whether it be the Biden administration saying unions are a good thing to the Pope saying unions are a good thing uh, in recent weeks. I think we're starting to see a change across the world where people are recognising that you perhaps need public services to deal, you know, in a public sector approach and a government approach to deal with world's crisis. But also we're seeing people recognising that you need trade unions to speak for working people. You need a strong trade union movement to create a more socially just world. Well, it's interesting, um, you know, the Biden administration's commitment to the, the their new nationally determined contribution actually, I think, is the only one that references unions and workers who supply our basic services need to be uh, recognized to, for their role. Of course, at the G7, though, the same administration was talking about mobilizing private finance and all the rest of it. So I think there's a lot of contradictions there. But what Steve Smiley from Unison Scotland said in a recent call was that Greta had, had put the word strike back into the sort of the polit you know, the discourse and the political discourse, because, you know, there hasn't been that many strikes. If I could speak from the US perspective, we've been, you know, um, the lowest strike levels ever, I think, but I think that might be beginning to change. So, um, but that social justice dimension is is so so important. I'm gonna. I, there's a question here from Margaret from New York, uh, Margaret Matz. So let me see if I can read it. Uh, she thanks you, Roz, for your illuminating presentation. I'm a member of a small union, District Council 37. Not so small, Margaret, uh, because we're involved in design and construction. Um, uh, we'd like to articulate our union interests regarding climate change, especially as they relate to our involvement with progressive, uh, with projects completed through our labor. So it sounds like that's a, 
Again, similar to the question before, how do we make sure that the jobs that are created out of the transition are union uh, union jobs? And um, I think we've we've dealt with that uh, fairly adequately. I've got a couple more um, here um, about the oh yes, um, reminded to mention our collaboration with the um, UNCTAD, the UN agency that's on trade and development, which. Uh, we're organizing a meeting on the 9th uh, in, at the Scottish TUC headquarters because UNCTAD has been a lone voice in supporting a progressive vision of global public goods, not just for climate, but uh, for just about everything we need, particularly on the level of health and um, financial stability, et cetera. So I think that's, uh, uh, that seems to be, I'm asked, is that different from the mainstream messages promoted at COP26? Um, I think it probably is, but it's an opening, is it not, that we can begin because of the pandemic and vaccine apartheid, start to talk about global public goods a lot more confidently. And that's exactly what the um, uh, Secretary General of the UN did in his more recent report. So maybe there will be some opportunities on the inside. Um, do you have any messages, Ross, for like the audience in the US? I mean, because you've probably been following US politics a lot lately in terms of what's going on, um, not just in climate, but generally speaking, in terms of the change in administration, et cetera. Yeah, well, I think my first message would be a massive thank you uh, to, you know, activists uh, in the US for getting rid of Trump. Um, there was a lot of hard, you know, elections take a lot of hard work, a lot of community organising, a lot of workplace organising, and uh, I've got no doubt that uh, there's a lot of people out there who had to put their heart and soul into uh, what was, you know, quite a narrow uh, victory, and I'd like to thank them for that, because I think it has worldwide uh, implications, and I certainly know that we were all on tender hooks, really hoping to see the result that actually did take place uh, happening. Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, that there are so many things happening, the use of new technology. We're actually involved in a conference at the end of this week, just before the COP starts, all around the, the issue of digital organising and how do we, you know, overcome some of the, the platform economy uh, issues that we face in organising workers. Um, and I, I think that we have a lot that we can all teach each other at a global level. I think global conversations are really important. Um, and, you know, we certainly are seeing more industrial action and more militancy taking place within our movement, but it's good for us to share our victories, to talk about our techniques and what we're learning in this modern world as a trade union movement. And, you know, we can give each other confidence, but we can also give each other really good ideas and learning. So. I think my message would be that the STUC really wants to, you know, share and learn from trade union organisations across the US and the rest of, of the globe. I think I think on our lesson, we would communicate here at the School of Labour and Urban Studies is activism and militancy is absolutely essential. But we also need to know what we would do if we were ever in a position to seriously influence um, you know, the outcomes. And to that effect, we've been working for a year now with um, with unions around the world and with the STUC had a lot of input on this um, interim report on a public energy future. And we're going to be making that available when it's completed in the coming months. But we'll be talking about that when we get to Glasgow, because is it not, you know, the um, going back to the whole question of if it's not us, then who who will it be if if we don't like the transition that's on the table right now because of its ineffectiveness ecologically and its regressiveness socially um then we need to take responsibility and say how it could be done differently and push our parties our you know our elected representatives the ones we support to carry that out so a final word word from you ros because i think we're probably running out of time although i haven't heard uh I don't see any more questions and you probably have to get going pretty soon. Really looking forward to being with you in Glasgow and the other comrades there. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I would just say to those of you who are coming to Glasgow, I really look forward to mobilizing with you, working with you and getting that trade union uh, and worker message across and the really important discussions that, that have to take place because we must uh, meet this climate crisis head on and do what needs to be done. 
how it's done is something that we need to be involved in that conversation. And you know, there are things that we can do at Glasgow, but there are things that we can that we can and must do beyond Glasgow in our own communities, our own legislators, uh, and that very local cool level right up to national and international level. So you know, look forward to working with you all on this agenda because it's going to need all our efforts in the period ahead. Great. Well, we've been talking to Ros Foyer, the um, General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, who's a very busy uh, trade union comrade at the moment. And we're, um, we're looking forward to uh, reporting back after, after Glasgow on what happened and to work with you in the, in the future and, and, and what we're collectively trying to do. So I thank you on behalf of the School of Labour and Urban Studies and uh, Reinventing Solidarity. And um, we're going to get this message out. Thanks, Ross. Thanks, Sean.